it's always sad to see a couple break up. You believe that they can make it. You believe that they could stand the test of time and all the trials and tribulations that we deal on this world we call Earth. But it looks like there's a story that's being talked about. And it's absolute shite. It is complete bull. Don't believe it. Don't believe it for one single second that there's a breakup between Biden and Netanyahu. Okay? Now, we have to talk about this because there's a reason why we're seeing by corporate media, the establishment, about why there's a falling out between Biden and Netanyahu. I mean, it's very clear that APEC has absolute control and has bought many of our politicians, both Democrat and, yes, Republican. Okay? Democrats and Republicans. You hear that, AOC? AOC, it's both Democrats and Republicans. It's just not just Republicans. It's Democrats and Republicans at the federal and state level. And that goes for their influence in previous Democrat and Republican presidential administrations. And Joe Biden, I think it's the first time in a long time we have witnessed a president constantly getting dismissed, not only by his colleagues in Congress, in the U.S. Senate, but also internationally as well. And no one has been slapped around more than Biden than by Netanyahu. And let's be clear, the only reason why Biden is calling for any kind of cease or all this other stuff is to appease his voting base. But it's never brought up with any other kind of power, which is why Netanyahu has been giving a middle finger to the international community and to President Joe Biden's administration. But if you think that they're going to be breaking up or that the United States is going to halt all aid to Israel, I'm so sorry. Believe in something else. And if you're part of the Vote Blue, no matter who crowd, or either that uncommitted voters holding out for the audacity to hope that somehow the Democrats are going to see the light, you're gravely mistaken. Now, here's this garbage article right here by Political, because they go into all detail about, oh my goodness gracious, Cretaceous. Politico, from I love you to asshole. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. How Joe Biden gave up. I'm BB. How? After decades of building a close personal uh, friendship with Benjamin Netanyahu, Joe Biden has had it with the Israeli prime minister, and now he's hitting him hard. And it may be working. So the last time Joe Biden uh, Netanyahu got into public spat as ugly as this one was 14 years ago. In March 2010, Biden traveled to Jerusalem to push President Barack Obama's ambitious peace plans on Netanyahu, the prime minister whom the then vice president uh, upon landing called his close personal friend of over 30 years. Obama wanted to freeze a construction of Israeli settlements in the West Bank to avoid depriving the Palestinians of land for a future state. Which, by the way, those settlements were still built. OK, like, come on. Come on, this it was all show. Even the WWE has more realistic storylines and plot lines than what we saw with this one 14 years ago. I mean, come on. George Mitchell uh, restarted the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, but upon Biden's arrival, Netanyahu's government suddenly announced the construction of 1,600 new Israeli apartments in the disputed territory. This humiliated and enraged Biden, who reiterated, who, Retaliate by keeping his close personal friend Bibi waiting for an hour and a half at dinner that night. Oh, he had him waiting. Oh, geez. So, 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 sounds like any other kind of good toxic relationship, right? Ah. Biden publicly criticized Netanyahu for the move, but he also insisted that things be smoothed over, pressing Obama not to turn the uh, contracts uh, in. Uh, uh, contradempts uh, into a major incident. The current dispute between the two men is very different. In recent weeks, after months of Netanyahu openly defying Biden's calls for restraint in Gaza, the president launched an unprecedented and very public pressure campaign. What pressure campaign when the Washington Post and numerous other articles out there have once again shown that Biden knew that Israel, under Netanyahu's command, was targeting civilian homes, apartments, residential areas, community centers, hospitals, schools, places of worship. Biden and his administration knew. We talked about this on the Post Duopoly show this week. Everybody knew. The Biden administration knew. But yet somehow he's pushing back. He slammed sanctions on Israeli settlers and settlements. He invited Netanyahu's chief rival, Benny Gatz, to the White House, which, by the way, look, if this is the case that they want to replace Netanyahu with somebody else, Benny isn't going to be any more different. He's just going to be a more polite 
lesser evil. And we all know the problem with lesser evil is we're still putting in evil. So there you go. Uh, to the White House to meet with Vice President Kamala Harris, which must have been a very awkward meeting. He issued a National Security Council memo suggesting military aid to be Israel be conditioned on the delivery of humanitarian aid. We're still sending them weapons. And he also told BSDNC, I mean MSNBC, that Netanyahu was hurting Israel more than helping Israel. All the while reportedly fuming in private about what an asshole, an asshole Netanyahu had become. Wow, really? Well, why is Netanyahu being a jagoff? Well, let's pull up this one. The Israeli offense in Rafa would lead to massacres, the doctors warned the UN. So Netanyahu has made it very clear that he's still going to be continue on with military actions against the city of Rafa, which is home to 1.5 million refugees, knowing the fact that most of Gaza has been destroyed. Uh, I want to make it very clear here, too, that even though we heard Senator Chucky Boy Schumer, remember Chucky Boy? Good old Chucky Boy Schumer right here. Let's want to pull this up here. The good old Chucky Boy Schumer. Chucky Boy Schumer was dead set on saying, once the war winds down, once the war winds down, then people can elect a new prime minister. The people of Israel should elect a new prime minister. Well, the war's not winding down anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> Chucky Boy. So let's go ahead and talk about it even further. So uh, more than 1 million civilians are reportedly starving, uh, have uh, taken refuge in the area after early Israeli attacks leveled their neighborhoods. This is probably the worst crisis that can happen within this war. Uh, Dr. Zaire, a uh, solo co-founder of the U.S.-based Med Global uh, Medical Charity, told reporters on Tuesday at the U.N. headquarters in New York, if there is any offense, there's, there's going to, they're going to have a bloodbath. Oh, my goodness, that triggering word, bloodbath, massacres after massacres. Uh, he added that his colleagues who are still working in Gaza have warned that an Israeli assault on Rafah could lead to 250,000 deaths. That number is going to be much higher. Uh, Sahul uh, was among uh, was among a group of Western doctors, doctors who traveled to Washington this week for meetings with U.S. lawmakers and government officials to bring more attention uh, to the uh, desperate, desperate humanitarian conditions brought on by uh, by the Israel Hamas war. And by the way, there is talk about uh, how they're building uh, a port. And just in case any of you forgot about that little port that's being built there, um, it is being built. It is being built by the homes that have been destroyed. Here's George Galloway bringing that up in this short clip. We have a situation where daily, if not hourly, new and dramatic foreign policy developments are occurring. Just this day, for example, Prime Minister Netanyahu announced that this port that's being built in Gaza with the rubble of the homes destroyed in the bombing, including the skulls and the bones of the people destroyed with the houses and lying unburied under the rubble, that according to Netanyahu, this port is being built for the deportation of millions of Palestinians from the territory, an act of ethnic cleansing of the foulest kind. We would have expected a statement from the Foreign Secretary in the light of such a dramatic development. But statement came there none and could come there none. His able deputy, and I share the Honourable Gentleman's feelings for the Minister of State, a fine man, I've known him a very long time. He cannot possibly cope with all of this workload as effectively Lord Cameron's deputy in here. His now, that's just a short clip. We played the rest of that video on uh, yesterday's show uh, where George Galloway was talking about how we are sleepwalking into World War III. But folks, I want to pull up this video here from Case Study QB. Came out two days ago discussing how dependent Israel is on America and why President Biden isn't using his leverage on Benjamin Netanyahu. And there's a reason why. It's because APAC has bought our politicians off. APAC owns our political system. APAC owns them. And even though MSNBC did that fantastic video piece, fantastic in quotation, saying like how they recently just got involved, they've been paying people under the table. They've been handling things on the side. For the first time in a hundred generations, we, the Jewish people, can defend ourselves. 
That was Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in 2015, making a joint address to Congress, urging against a nuclear deal with Iran. He raised the specter of genocide in his remarks, but said defiantly that Israel could defend itself. However, that was not entirely true then, and it's not entirely true today. Israel has never defended itself by itself. Israel is the largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid since its... Now, how, how did that get passed and get the sign of approval on BSDNC? Occasionally, sometimes they have to when public pressure is high enough. And the reason why public pressure is high enough, and I will continue on with the rest of that video... The president is also facing serious rebellion. This is from that same political article. And this is this political article was a toe-to-toe -to -toe slug match to read through. But, folks, the links are in the description box below. Uh, the president is also facing a serious rebellion from his own Democrat Party, led largely by Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, who in February sponsored an amendment conditioning any future aid to Israel on opening up humanitarian corridors. The Van Hollen Amendment is, in turn, led to the uh, NSC memo. A in an interview with Political Magazine this week, Van Hollen said he hadn't seen enough effort by Biden uh, to make that stick, and he believes that the administration is internally divided on how tough to get with Netanyahu. And the reason why is because Netanyahu, APEC, have influence over our politicians, and this is something that Joe Biden doesn't want to do. So, again, un uncommitted voters. Biden knew the severity and the destructive tactics that the IDF was doing in Gaza way back in October. They knew. So to you vote blue, no matter who sickle fans out there, to you people who believe that the Democrats care, they knew and they didn't lift a finger. This administration knew. And before anyone says, well, what about Trump? Well, what about Trump? No matter who sits in the throne, it's going to suck. This is what happens when you vote for the lesser of two evils. You will always get evil until the American people wake up to the fact that both parties do not give an F about you. George Carlin was a prophet. He's probably doing a musical, a big Broadway musical up in the sky saying, I told you so. If you think you have a seat at the table, you don't. And so if the administration didn't give a damn about the people in Gaza, what does that say about this administration thinking about the American people? They know that we're starving, we're struggling, they don't give a damn. And the only reason why right now there's talk of a, a breakup, a heartbreak, oh my goodness, how sad it is, oh, how terrible, it is to sucker people to vote for Biden in the November election. That's all it is, to let your guard down so that if Biden gets elected into office, oh, him and Netanyahu are friends again. It was all one big act. You get it? Do you get the game? Because that's what's going to happen. That's what will happen. And if not Netanyahu, it'll be his replacement, right? And hey, you're still friends. And oh, no, oh, surprise, surprise. Military action still being done against the people of the West Bank and in Gaza. That's if there's anybody still going to be left in Gaza. Because remember, Chuck Schumer said the Israeli people should pick a new leader once the war winds down. And from articles I've read, and everybody else in independent media, and have all of you read, a few weeks ago, Netanyahu said, hey, the war could probably continue on until 2025. We're still in 2024, folks. And he's continuing doing military action in Rafa. So this is still ongoing. It's all an act. It's all theater. This breakup is being hyped up into something that it's not. And even if there is the visual image of them having a falling out, you think the alliance between the United States and Israel is going to disappear overnight? APAC bought a lot of Democratic and Republican politicians. It's not going to disappear. They'll have like, um, I guess, a, a separation, you know. They're, 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 they're taking a little break, and then they'll be right back together again, like any toxic couple. Let's go back to this video. Creation. According to congressional, congressional data, it has received more than $200 billion in economic assistance and billions more in missile defense funding. That assistance includes some of the weapons that Israel is using in its war with Hamas, a war that has now claimed more than 31,000 lives and counting, according to the Palestinian Ministry of Health. At the start of this conflict, President Joe Biden was quick to offer his unwavering support of Israel's right to defend itself, but he's begun criticizing Prime Minister Netanyahu over attacks on civilians and a, block, a blockade of aid that could force as many as 1.1 million people, half the population of Gaza, to the brink of starvation. President Biden keeps calling for Israel to show restraint, but 
could he go farther? He has leverage in this situation. The supply of U.S. weapons paid for by American citizens that Israel is using in this war. So why won't the president use that particular leverage? Joining me now is Michelle Goldberg, opinion columnist for The New York Times. Michelle, thank you uh, for being with us. It's an interesting few weeks we've been watching where President Biden announced airdrops of aid, announced uh, a sea bridge that that Anthony Blinken says will be. A uh, sea bridge, a port that's built out the rubble and remains of uh, Palestinian homes. There might be human remains in that rubble. You know? Just saying, it's a port built out of blood. Be in effect in about two weeks. As if we're dealing with a country with whom we don't enjoy uh, great influence. He would really like Netanyahu to allow the aid into Gaza, and yet he can't get him to do it. You're the president of the United States, a global superpower. We are Rome. What a sad sight it is to see a Caesar weak, frail, fragile. He's a leader of a global superpower, and yet he can't do anything. What does that tell you about uh, our current situation of our great republic, right? And again, folks, I know I keep on saying again, but remember, just remember, this is all theater. Because we are in the middle of an election and the Democrats have lost their great coalition. Why do you think they're dusting out old Bernie? I can't even say his name. Bernie Sanders. And he's doing his fantastic podcast because trust me on it. He's going to be talking about his book. And then two, once two episodes, three episodes uh, afterwards, he's going to talk about why you need to support his good friend, Joe. His good friend, Joe. Because the Democrats can't build up the enthusiasm. Like the great enthusiasm of the 2016 and 2020 primaries is gone. It's non-existent. It's non-existent. It's not there. Look at the voter turnout. No one's excited. Well, look, I think that, um, you know, Netanyahu has always shown, you know, he, he expects enormous amounts of deference from American leaders and shows Democratic presidents, um, you know, kind of complete contempt and defiance. And we've seen this over and over again. And I think he depends on domestic politics constraining American presidents, or at least Democratic American presidents, because obviously... Hold on, I'm going to read this out from Bad Cookies. Biden and his administration are trying to wash their hands from this atrocity, but they can't. No soap will wash the blood off uh, the hands of this administration. They will see. Uh, they will never see one second at the Hague for any of this. Out, Spot! Out, Lady Macbeth! That's the whole entire administration. Well said, Bad Cookies. But everyone, you and my audience, you all see it. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows about it. Everybody's going to keep on talking about it. This is all an act. All these headlines of Netanyahu and Biden are breaking up. Oh, no. It's not. But the administration is trying to sucker voters to once again support Biden in the 2024 election. And they already look. Maybe maybe I could be wrong about this. But I would be surprised if there aren't protesters and activist groups at the DNC convention here in Chicago. There's going to be two different locations, the McCormick Place and the United Center. Democrats, how are you going to inspire people to turn out to vote when you gave a middle finger to most of your coalition? Israel has very strong supporters among you know, large parts of the American Jewish community, among evangelical Christians. It's made it in the past. Bad cookies, you be nice. I'm sorry, but uh, one look at this woman and all I could think about is the vil some villain in a Pixar movie. This is a family-friendly show, Bad Cookies. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Asked, you know, kind of politically poisonous to go against Israel. But that hasn't always been the case. Um, you know, I think a example that people bring up all the time is Ronald Reagan basically demanding that Begin stop, I think, what he called a holocaust in Lebanon in the 80s. And there's other times in which American presidents have exercised real leverage over Israel. It just falls to Biden to actually do it. But what you just commented on, what Netanyahu knows, is that there are domestic political considerations about that in America. So where Biden is facing pressure from uh, some progressives and some people within the uh, Democratic Party for not exercising that, that, um, that leverage that he's got, if he were to, what happens then? 
Well, I think that, look, there's blowback either way. And so at a certain point you say, you know, you have to kind of make a decision based on morality and leadership, not just domestic political calculations. Well, let's look at this, okay? Because hold on. It's one thing to sit through corporate media and case study QB, you're made out of stronger stuff than me. So let's really talk about what's going on, okay? The real truth. And that is Netanyahu has power. He's not going to listen to Biden. The reason why Netanyahu has power is because, listen, by association through APAC and everyone else in that organization, Netanyahu knows he has allies in the United States Senate and House. And he knows that the president of the United States needs Congress, or at least in theory needs Congress, to get things done. And I want to pull up this video here. Shout out again to somebody who's going to be speaking truth to power, Glenn Greenwald. How Netanyahu laughed in the face of Biden's red line for Israel, which stated that an invasion of Rafah refugee camp would be a bridge too far. We already have seen articles of Netanyahu excited to give the order. Let's play this video. The White House did get to a certain point where it seemed like they were at least pretending to impose a condition on Israel. They were drawing what was called a red line. Namely that the Biden White House was supposedly telling Israel that it was not going to tolerate Israel invading and bombing the refugee camp in Rafah, which is where more than a million Palestinians have now congregated, one of the only places in Gaza that they can be safe, although the Israelis have attacked that refugee camp several times before. By the way, folks, let's have democracy in the chat before we continue on with the rest of this video. Do you think the breakup's real? Type one for Kit. This is very real. President Biden is going to stand up and be the leader that the American people deserve. And he's going to confront Netanyahu. And there's going to be finally a real fresh peace and reconstruction. You'll see, you awful man. A type two, no, man. This is all smoke and mirrors. It's all a joke. Doesn't matter. It's all hoping that people will fall for it. Because they think we're suckers. I wonder how many twos will get in the chat. I wonder. I also wonder how many ones. Because I'm an awful, awful man. Four. And here in Politico, in uh, on March 10th, the headline was, Biden warns of a red line for Israel over Rafa. So it seemed like, at least in terms of what the Biden White House wanted the media to convey to Americans, that Joe Biden was finally setting a condition on what the Israelis could do, namely this safe space for Palestinian civilians, the only place they can be in, in this refugee camp is a bridge too far for us. We will not let you go there and invade there because it will kill far too many Palestinian civilians on top of the Palestinian civilians, the massive tragic number you've already killed. And then under that, it says Cy Cyprus aid ship gets ready to open humanitarian sea corridor to Gaza. And here is the news report from Politico last month or, or just 10 days ago. Quote, U.S. President Joe Biden warned the Israeli government against a further intensification of bloodshed in the Gaza Strip as worries grow over the humanitarian disaster in the enclave. Quote, we cannot have another 30,000 more Palestinians dead, Biden said in an interview with MSNBC on Saturday. Asked whether an invasion of Rafah in the south of Gaza on the border with Egypt was a red line, Biden replied in the affirmative, it is a red line. It's a red line. Now, that is presidential talk for this isn't something that we're only, that we're, this isn't something that we're just against. This is something we will not allow. We will not tolerate. We will not permit. So Biden called that a red line, meaning this is something that the Israelis cannot cross. In general, it's considered a major blow to presidential credibility for the president or the White House to declare that something is a red line and then have a country cross it with absolutely no consequences. And yet, unsurprisingly, I think, we learn that the that now government is being very clear that they have absolutely no intention of observing Biden's, quote, red line. They don't care in the slightest just like they won't allow the United States to bring in humanitarian aid through American trucks and force the Americans in front of the world to suffer one of the gravest humiliations the American government has had to suffer in airdropping aid to a 
group of people because their own ally refuses to allow them in to provide aid. Now the Netanyahu government is very ready to humiliate the Biden White House again by saying we don't care about the American red line. Even though the United States is paying for our war and arming us, and even though it will continue to do so, we're not going to limit ourselves to what the Biden administration tells us we can and can't do. Here from Politico, Netanyahu vows to defy Biden's red line on Rafa. Israeli prime minister insists his priority is to prevent another terror attack like the October 7 Hamas raid. I want to pause here and bring up that political article again. And this shows also why Biden <clears throat> is putting on this act, or at least why the administration and through attachment, corporate media is trying to say that they are having a falling out. But that may mean playing with political fire at a time when polls show Biden losing to Trump in November. Biden has to worry about both sides of the issue. In the 1992 election, after uh, pressing Israel hard, George H.W. Bush just received 15 percent of the Jewish vote, the lowest percentage obtained by a Republican presidential candidate since Barry Goldwater in 1964. Goldwater, hey. Remember Hill Dog? She used to be a Goldwater girl. At the same time, however, Biden may decide that the threat from progressives unhappy about his uncompromising support of Israel could hurt him in key swing states with large Arab American populations like Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, Biden's geopolitical standing is in danger, too, as Israel grows more isolated with several nations, including Canada, Holland and Denmark, considering a total cutoff in military aid because. Everyone. We are not on board with the idea of seeing men, women, and children being killed, being decimated, being blown up. Everybody sees it. And we're asking our leaders, is this acceptable? Is this something that you approve of? And apparently, this administration knew it from the very freaking beginning. They knew, they knew, they knew. So all those people in 2020, when you were saying that Trump Trump was the bad guy. I get it. I understand why you're triggered by Trump. But all this stuff that you were saying about how horrible Trump would be and how great Biden would be, you guys look like you're covered in shit now to me. You're a joke. An absolute laughing stock. I can't take you seriously. All you vote blue no matter who, people. What do you got to say now? Do you really think Biden is going to cut off military aid? To Israel, the answer is no, because you still have to contend with the United States Senate and House and Democratic and Republican politicians will not give up that almighty dollar because they love the green. Israel is anything but independent. Israel is completely dependent on the United States for fighting this war. And so if the United States says this is a red line for us strategically, because we believe that if you do this, we'll you'll create huge amounts of problems for our national security. Or this is a red line for us ethically or morally that we will not support and don't want to be associated with in front of the world. The killing of thousands more Palestinian civilians, children and women and, and innocent men. And the Israelis just turn around and say, we don't give the slightest uh, concern for what your red lines are. Any country with dignity, any political leader with any dignity would have to then follow through and say, well, if you're going to cross our red line, we're not going to pay for your war anymore. This is so basic. If your child is financially dependent on you, it means you get to set the rules. Once they're financially dependent and couldn't live on their own and support themselves as adults, then they can make their own rules about how they live their lives. But until that happens, when you're still paying their bills, as a parent, you have the right to set rules for what you want to support. And we give a lot of money to Israel. You know, they got Medicare. They, they got health care for their citizens. You know, they got a lot of wonderful stuff there. How come we don't have that? You know, I mean, I'm going to make a controversial statement here. And you know what? If it causes a massive amount of people to unsubscribe or say, like, I can't believe you said that kit. Well, hang on. Controversial statement in a three, two, one. You would think, in theory, that a nation, a global superpower, as rich as the United States, would prioritize its citizens first and ensuring that they have secure housing, clean environments, air, soil, water, proper education working and adequate infrastructure, a political system that represents and does the will of the people. 
that the people aren't suffering medical bankruptcy, that our health care is number one, that the priority is the citizen and the well-being of the state and the people to uplift and build a better future, not only for themselves, but the next generation. Maybe that's a controversial statement here, but what I'm seeing here now is this rich country is giving unchecked military aid and military resources to ongoing wars overseas, causing deaths and destruction, mass migrations, political instability. I'm seeing this government bail out corporations. I'm seeing this government, you know, do regime change wars and coups. I mean, that's their number one priority. I, I would go with the first option, taking care of the people. But maybe, maybe that's a bridge too far. Maybe it's just too much. Maybe I am asking too much. You see, he, he, I, I paused Glenn at a perfect time. He's like, yeah, I agree. I don't know. What What do you think? Is that a bridge too far? Maybe it is. And the United States has every right, in fact, every obligation, if it's paying for Israel's war and arming Israel's war, to say there are certain things with which we don't want to be associated. And the Biden administration said that. The White House said that. Invading the Rafa refugee camp is a red line for us. And now you have the Israelis saying, we don't care about your red lines. Netanyahu's saying, we're going to ignore your red line. So the only solution is an obvious one, which is that the United States would have to say to the Israelis, that comes next. We're not going to pay for your war anymore then. We're not going to arm your war anymore. That's it. Money's off. But will that happen? Well, I don't know. But here's something that did happen. The Biden administration is calling now for a ceasefire. A ceasefire. Hang on. It's not what you think. Now to the Middle East tonight, the Biden administration taking a more aggressive stance and calling for an immediate ceasefire at the United Nations. Raf Sanchez is in Israel with late details. Tonight, Secretary of State Antony Blinken back in the Middle East as the U.S. for the first time puts forward a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And we hope that all countries will back that resolution. Those against? It's a marked shift for the U.S., which was left diplomatically isolated after vetoing three previous ceasefire resolutions. But those measures called for an end to the fighting even without a hostage deal. So now we're calling for a ceasefire. Just wanted to pause it there for the release of the hot. Now, here's the thing. Think Netanyahu's still going to do that? No. Remember, Israel's been bombing all of Gaza while the hostage is still there. There's still people. I mean, I, I hope they're alive. I, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. They, they could be. They could not be. You think that's going to stop Netanyahu from doing his military attack on Rafa? The answer is no. But all right. The United States has decided to put in a ceasefire with the condition of releasing the hostages. Look, you had relatives go into the Israeli parliament begging their politicians say, hey we still got hostages here do something and the government still said no it's all an act it's all an act the new american resolution conditions a ceasefire on the release of hostages the negotiators continue to work uh, the gaps are narrowing while at al shifa hospital israel's military raids stretching into a fourth day What's the city they're going after? What's the city that uh, happened again? Say again. The gaps are narrowing. While at Al Shifa Hospital, Israel's military raids stretching into a fourth day. Okay, now again, that's at the hospital, right? That means the buildup for what's going to happen in Rafa. The IDF says it's killed 140 militants inside and captured senior Hamas operatives. But it's another blow to a healthcare system already near collapse. It's a fact Manal and Reem know well. Both are mothers from Gaza, suffering from breast cancer. My wish is to see my children and grandchildren and go back home, Manal says. They were allowed out of Gaza for treatment in Jerusalem. But now an Israeli court is deciding whether to send them back to a place where basic medicines are impossible to find. And that's... Uh, that's According to Joe Biden, our aircraft carrier in the Middle East, a bastion of democracy and human rights. These are our allies? What? What happened? 
How? Why? Our fate will be death, she says. And the U.S. says it'll bring that U.N. resolution up for a vote Friday morning. Also tomorrow, the CIA director will be in Qatar trying to jumpstart those hostage negotiations. Yeah, and so I want to wrap this up with a voice of somebody who's very reasonable. I want to give it up for a good friend of the show, Sabi Sabs, who's been doing some great work. All right, and I want to give a shout-out to Metal Music Sped Up. $5, thank you so much for the YouTube Super Chat. What an absolute effing joke this administration is. Oh, man, you're, you're not going to – I'm not going to argue with you. The Democratic Party is co-opting the term ceasefire. So vote blue no matter who and un, uh, uncommitted voters. Just remember, if you think that they really believe in the word ceasefire, good luck. They're not going to do it. Dems are trying to be pro-humanitarian pause. The way we use language is very important. The demands of a ceasefire in Gaza are different from what the Kamala, Kamala and Biden want. Let's go and pull this up. Take it away, Seb Sabs. ...have been co-opted by the Democratic Party. I saw that with BLM. I even see that now with the pro-Palestinian protests where we do have people like Kamala Harris uh, calling for what the media said was a ceasefire. It actually wasn't. She was calling for a temporary pause, which Joe Biden had already called for. So this wasn't like a big thing, but they made it a big thing. Um, I'm noticing now that term ceasefire has been co-opted by the Democratic Party and they, they've they watered it down like they've done before yeah. when they co-opt certain movements. Yeah, that's exactly right. That clip, The clip with uh, Kamala Harris, where she says that we want a ceasefire you know, specific you know, pause right there for a second, just so she knows that the media can get the clip of that and ignore the rest of the sentence, which is, you know, for X amount of time, blah, 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 with all the stipulations attached. Okay, okay that's clever. Um, very sneaky. But yeah, it's the it's the same thing with uh, like defund the police. That was another one that was kind of co-opted. It was first, it was abolish the police and then it became defund the police and then, you know, accountability, stuff like that. Um, same thing is happening with ceasefire, whether they're, they're trying to do for a humanitarian pause or a brief ceasefire. And uh, the Palestinian people have been adamant, no, we're not asking for a brief humanitarian pause so we can release hostages and then you can continue butchering us. We are demanding a permanent ceasefire and an end to the illegal occupation. And so the the way we use language is very important. It's It's critical that we understand how the demands for a ceasefire coming out of Palestine are different from the offerings of a quote unquote ceasefire peddled by policy wonks and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So thank you, Savvy. Thank you everybody for tuning in for this because look, final note, they're not breaking up. It, it's, it's all going to be a show. You think the Alliance is going to be broken? No. You think the Democrats believe in ceasefire? No. You think the Democrats give a damn about the people of Gaza? No. They're only doing this so they can secure enough suckers, I mean voters, to help Joe Biden defeat Trump in a 2024 presidential election cycle. I mean, at this point, what, what else will it take for people to finally see that this is all one big joke? And they're going to use a phrase, ceasefire, to sucker in voters to support the Democrats, but they don't believe in ceasefire. It's like they don't believe in any any kind of movement that's gaining popularity. You think the Democrats get, believed in Me Too and Time's Up? No, they didn't. They never did. Me Too and Time's Up is the biggest, well, one of the biggest jokes. I mean, there's a lot of big jokes. You think the Democrats care about Black Lives Matter? No. You think Democrats care about the kids in cages? No. You think Democrats care about uh, the people in Gaza? No. You think Democrats care about the unending wars? No, they don't. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. And it's just a look. You got a senile old man talking to a crazy, insane leader, thinking that somehow what th there's going to be a peaceful resolution? No. You think Israel's going to listen to the United States? The, is, the United States is going to cut off all financial aid to Israel? No. So when you see the media saying, oh, this is it, Joe Biden standing up to Netanyahu, it's not. It's not. 